On the night of August 17, 1969, Jerry Peralta, the police chief in a small Mississippi town, he was driving his squad car along the beach highway, warning the residents to evacuate because of an approaching storm. And the winds were already kicking up to around 60 miles an hour when he came to the Richelieu Apartments, a set of nice brick buildings overlooking the beach. Twelve people had gathered there for a party to welcome the arrival of the storm. And despite his strongest warnings of the danger, Chief Peralta couldn't persuade those revelers to leave. And that night, Hurricane Camille, with winds of 190 miles an hour, leveled the Richelieu apartments, killing all who had celebrated her coming. Now, it's a terrible thing to be deceived about impending doom, to have a false sense of security in the face of approaching disaster. It's terrible because it prevents one from taking the steps necessary for protection. If those people in Mississippi, and because those people in Mississippi, they wrongly believed their apartment building could withstand the fury of Camille, they passed up the opportunity to be saved. Now, it's bad enough to have a false sense of security about physical danger. But it is worse by far to have a false sense of security about the judgment of God. Physical dangers can maim and kill you, but the judgment of God can eternally condemn you. As Jesus said in Matthew 10, 28, do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Unfortunately, false security concerning the judgment of God is all too common among his people. I want to look with you this afternoon at the book of Amos. Now, Amos, of course, is one of what we call the minor prophets. But that means minor in terms of length, not minor in terms of significance. Now, you may recall that the, the United kingdom of Israel, it divided in 931 or 930 following the death of King Solomon. So when it divided, you had Israel was the kingdom to the north and Judah was the kingdom to the south. And this division, it was ordained by God as punishment for Solomon's idolatry. And you can see that in 1 Kings chapter 11. Now the 8th century B.C., which is from 800 B.C. down to 700 B.C. The 8th century B.C., it ushered in prosperous times for both of the kingdoms, both Israel to the north and Judah to the south. Under the leadership of Jeroboam II, Israel prospered. Under the leadership of Uzziah in the south, Judah prospered. And both of those nations, during that time, they rose to a prominence second only to Solomon's golden age. They prospered financially. They expanded their borders. And, all was, and, and they, were doing, they were doing great there. But unfortunately, as those kingdoms grew economically and militarily, as they grew more powerful, moral decay was eating at their insides. And it was at that time in the middle of the 8th century B.C. that God sent a shepherd from Tekoa, a small town in Judah, to prophesy to the people of Israel. And though he was a Judean, Amos seems to have prophesied exclusively to the northern kingdom, to the kingdom of, in the kingdom of Israel. Now Amos made clear that despite their election and their constant blessing by God, that the people of Israel were living in rebellion. For example, he declares in chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, this is what the Lord says, for three sins of Israel, even for four, I will not relent. They sell the innocent for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. 
They trample on the heads of the poor as on the dust of the ground and deny justice to the oppressed. Father and son use the same girl and so profane my holy name. They lie down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. In the house of their God they drink wine taken as fines. And he says in verses 11 and 12, I also raised up prophets from among your children and Nazarites from among your youths. Is this not true, people of Israel, declares the Lord? But you made the Nazarites drink wine and commanded the prophets not to prophesy. They practiced idolatry. They abused the poor and underprivileged. They deprived the powerless of justice. They muzzled the prophets. And they ignored all of God's attempts to bring them to repentance. And it is to these people that Amos chapter 5, verses 18 to 20, are addressed. And the prophet says there, Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Why do you long for the day of the Lord? That day will be darkness, not light. It will be as though a man fled, fled from a lion only to meet a bear. As though he entered his house and rested his hand on the wall only to have a snake bite him. Will not the day of the Lord be darkness, not light, pitch dark, without a ray of brightness? You see, they lived in rebellion to God, and yet so deceived themselves about the matter that they actually longed for His coming in judgment. They were that warped, and God tells them in no uncertain terms that they have absolutely no business hoping for that day. His coming in judgment will be a disaster for them. Their expectation that it will be a time of safety and even blessing will be shattered. It will be like a person who thinks he's safe after having fled from a lion only to be mauled by a bear. It will be like a person who thinks he's safe after entering his own home only to be struck by a deadly snake. The judgment they long for will be their destruction, not their vindication, not their rescue. And of course, that judgment came to pass when God brought the Assyrians down on Israel in 722 when the city of Samaria was captured by the Assyrians. Now, you might think to yourself, how can people who are living in rebellion, deceive themselves into thinking they're right with God. How could they possibly have a false sense of security? How could they possibly think His judgment would be a blessing for them? Well, God gives us the answer in the following verses. He says in Amos 5, 21 to 24, I hate, I despise your religious festivals. I cannot stand your assemblies. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. But let justice roll on like a river. Righteousness like a never-failing stream. The source of their false security with God was their religious ritual. That was the source of their false security. They thought they could be justified before God by offering Him tokens of devotion rather than control of their lives. They offered God religious festivals, solemn assemblies, songs and sacrifices all of which proclaimed that he was worthy of being honored and obeyed, but then they ignored his will for their lives. They lived as they wanted. They lived as they saw fit. The whole time bringing God these things that proclaimed his greatness and his holiness and his worthiness to be obeyed, but they just went on living the way they wanted. And God says flatly, this isn't acceptable. That he despises such hypocritical worship. 
He wants genuine worship. He wants worship that flows from or emanates from a faith that finds expression in life. A faith that produces a life of justice and righteousness. And you see precisely that same sentiment expressed in Proverbs chapter 15 verse 8. In Isaiah chapter 1 verses 10 through 17. Jeremiah chapter 7 verses 9 through 11. And no doubt elsewhere. Now our ability to deceive ourselves in this way is greater than we might imagine. I'll never forget one Christmas Eve about eight years before my brother John and I became Christians. We were out drinking with a mutual friend named Dominic. And we were working very hard to achieve the desired state of inebriation. When all of a sudden Dominic gets up and starts to leave the bar. And John and I say, where are you going? And he said, to midnight mass. Now that ought to strike you as absurd. It ought to strike you as absurd, but what about the person who's carrying on an immoral sexual relationship, living with a boyfriend or girlfriend or cheating on a spouse, but who attends church meetings regularly? What about the person who's intent on abusing drugs or alcohol, but who sings praise to God? Somebody like the lady who said not many years ago in Christianity Today, I'm a Jesus girl. But I also like to go out and do tequila shots with my friends. What about the person who's cheating his customers or stealing from his employer, but who wouldn't think of missing the Lord's Supper? What about the person who's devoted to pornography, has it hidden all over his computer, and worries that his wife might find it, but who gives money every time the collection plate comes by? What about the person who's cheating his way through school, but who seeks God's blessings in prayer. As Ronald Sider pointed out in his book, The Scandal of the Evangelical Conscience, polls show that Protestants who claim to take the Bible and their faith seriously, those who fall into the category of evangelicals, divorce their spouses just as often as their secular neighbors, beat their wives as often as their neighbors, and all are almost as materialistic and even more racist than their pagan friends. Now, Sider writes, scandalous behavior is rapidly destroying American Christianity. By their daily activity, most, quote, Christians regularly commit treason. And I love the way he expresses that. Regularly commit treason. With their mouths, they claim that Jesus is Lord, but with their actions, they demonstrate allegiance to money, sex, and self-fulfillment. Now, please understand, I'm not talking about the penitent who struggle with sins the way we all struggle with sins. I'm talking about those who refuse to surrender their sins, who refuse to confess them, refuse to renounce them, refuse to commit themselves to no longer practicing them. I'm talking to the person who has made an idol of his sin. I'm talking to the rebel who thinks he's convinced God to be happy with trinkets, mere tokens of devotion. One cannot disregard the will of God, treat it as something trivial, and then take comfort from the fact one believes intellectually that God exists. You remember Jesus' words in a, a favorite text of mine in Luke 6.46 where he says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? You see, talk is cheap. Anybody can say the words. But if there's not reality behind those words, the confession is worthless. I mean, Paul puts it clearly, doesn't he? In Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 to 8, he's writing to Christians. And Paul says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. People reap what they sow. Those who sow to please the sinful nature from that nature will reap destruction. Those who sow to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. A person of faith 
certainly can fall into sin. But a person who refuses to repent of sin, after being lured into it, who insists on living in sin, that person will receive no mercy. His or her embrace of sin, it belies any current profession of faith. In the terminology of James chapter 2, verses 14 to 16, that person has at most a dead faith, not a biblical faith, not a saving faith. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he was a brilliant young German pastor and seminary teacher who opposed Adolf Hitler's policies and he was executed by the Nazis just days before the Allies swept in to liberate Germany. He wrote in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, cheap grace is the grace we bestow on ourselves. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. Costly grace is the kingly rule of Christ. For whose sake a man will pluck out the eye which causes him to stumble, it is the call of Jesus Christ at which the disciple leaves his nets and follows him. That is what Jesus calls us to. He doesn't call us to any of this trivial stuff. He calls us to come and die, to come and give him our lives. That's what he asks us for. That's what Bonhoeffer is getting at. you just on a worldly level. On a worldly level, you imagine this scene. A husband calls his wife and tells her he has to work late at the office. But before he gets home, the wife, unbeknownst to her husband, learns that he's actually out committing adultery. Now, if the husband comes home with flowers, do you think the wife will accept them? Don't you think she would be insulted, angry, at his audacity, at his hypocrisy? Well, if we can understand that, it shouldn't be hard to grasp when it comes to God. It's the same idea. Now, I don't have time now to develop this, and I know you're glad for that, but I don't have time, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, Paul exhorts the Corinthians there to live a disciplined Christian life and he warns them of the danger of self-indulgence and he says this in the midst of a lengthy explanation of why they cannot continue eating sacrificial food in pagan temples right after that in chapter 10 he warns them against thinking that their baptism or their participation in the Lord's Supper will protect them from condemnation if they refuse to heed his instruction. He tells them that all of the Israelites, all of them who came out of Egypt, they all participated in a type of baptism, and they all shared in a type of Lord's Supper, and yet most of them, they all shared in that, in a type of baptism, and a type of Lord's Supper, but despite the fact they all shared in that, most of them were struck down in the wilderness. And his point is that if, if the Corinthians choose to rebel by insisting on practicing idolatry, which is what they were doing in eating the sacrificial food in the pagan temples, they cannot be expected to be saved by virtue of their baptism or their participation in the Lord's Supper, any more than could the Israelites. You see, any more than could the Israelites. Baptism and the Lord's Supper are vitally important, but they must never be seen as a license or an excuse to sin. The rebel who thinks those rituals will save him is deceived. On the day Christ returns... Those who refused to submit to his lordship, who insisted on being God over their own lives, are going to face God's wrath. Jesus said in Luke chapter 13, 22 to 28, 
Then Jesus went through the towns and villages teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? He said to them, make every effort to enter through the narrow door because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you'll stand outside knocking and pleading, Sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you will say, we ate and drank with you and you taught in our streets. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from me, where you come from away from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves thrown out. So you have to surrender. On that day, those who refused to submit to Christ will gain no benefit from pointing to some kind of marginal involvement with Christ. Saying, but I went to church. But I took communion. I read the Bible. I prayed. You must surrender your life. You must commit yourself wholeheartedly to serving the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Christianity is a call to come and die. Jesus could not have been clearer. In Luke 14, 26 and 27, He says, If anyone comes to Me and does not hate father and mother, it's a Semitic idiom for love less. You can see that in Matthew chapter 10, verse 37. Anyone who comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. I remember telling one of the lawyers I worked with in Orlando, Florida, the story of those who died celebrating the arrival of Hurricane Camille. And his comment has stuck with me through the years. He said, but the worst thing about dying that way would be knowing that you could have avoided it. Now, many times I've thought, so it will be with hell. That will be the same way. See, if any of us in this room, if any of us wind up there, we will know for eternity that we could have avoided it if we had only heeded the warning. Now, I'm well aware that we've become squeamish about preaching about judgment. We're afraid it makes God look mean or unchristian, especially in the eyes of young people who've drunk from the well of postmodernism, who've drunk this relativism, and they, they've consumed that. But we've got to see the message as redemptive. We have to see it as redemptive. It is the warning sounded by the watchman. It is the warning that enables hearers to prepare for approaching danger. I know some people may not like it, but if I can paraphrase the first clause of Proverbs chapter 27, verse 6, a true friend will tell you what you need to hear even when it hurts. And when Chief Peralta, when he told those revelers in Mississippi that they were facing doom, he did that to save them. And so did Jesus. When he said in Matthew chapter 7, verses 26 and 27, but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. And it fell with a great crash. Now, Christian, I say to you this afternoon, if you have divorced your life from your religion, if you've deceived yourself into thinking that God is satisfied with mere tokens of devotion, I am begging you to recognize the danger and to decide to repent. And if you're not a Christian, please don't take any kind of perverse comfort from the plight of rebellious Christians. Know that the danger you're in is every bit as grave. You're facing eternal condemnation. 
unless you accept the truth of what God has done in His Son, Jesus Christ, repent of your sins, and submit to Christian baptism. Now, if you've never made that decision, I urge you to do that with all my heart. And whatever state you're in, if you believe that we can help you in any way, it would be our privilege to try to do so. And what we ask as we sing the next song is that you come to the front and let us know about your need. Thanks. Thank you.